Can everyone hear me? Okay. Good afternoon and thank you for that really lovely introduction. Um, what have you heard? My name is Emma Jansen and I'm a final year student at the Portwood Institute of Art where I'm studying easel painting and conservation. I'm in my final year. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the course at the Courtauld, it's a three-year training programme designed to teach students practical skills within easel paintings conservation, but also analytical methods used within the technical examination of artworks. And I'm here to, today to talk to you about this painting that I recently treated, um, which belongs to the society, as you know. Um, and you can see it in the collection catalogue that's over there, but also you can go and look it up upstairs later if you want to as well. Um, the work is entitled The Plamentia Panel, uh, which is a title based on a current inscription on the painting, which is um, situated along the scrolls that you see. And this is just a rough translation based on what we can see. Um, and it refers to John Parmentier, who is the male donor on the left-hand side of the painting. I'll show you the details soon. Um, and the inscription also provides a rough date for the panel, um, which states that the Parmentier family donated the work in 1519. Um, however, at this point, I would like to mention that this inscription has been badly damaged in the past, and as a result has been heavily retouched and restored, so its interpretation needs to remain sceptical. Um, John Clementi is accompanied um, by St. John the Baptist, who is shown here um, wearing a camel skin robe and holding a lamb, as is traditional for his devices. And on the other side of the painting, we see St. Peter, who's holding the keys to heaven, and he's accompanied, uh, accompanied by the female donor, who's assumed to be John Clementi's wife. Um, and the centre of the painting is dominated by the figure of Christ, who in this case is surrounded by a orange and um, yellow coloured mandola. And he is flanked on the far left and the far right by two unnamed prophets. Um, I received the painting um, on my first year of course, um, and I completed the treatment just at the beginning of 2015. Um, and the painting was also the focus of a technical examination project at the Courtauld in 2013 which is carried out by three students, um, Olympia Diamond, Douglas McLennan, and Roxanne Sperber. Um, and their research and technical analysis that they undertook provided the basis for my own research that I did into the painting's possible original function, um, as well as its material composition. Um, so for this talk, I'm going to discuss some of the art historical and technical research that I did in order to um, inform my treatment of the painting. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, a detailed look at the panel's physical structure, as well as the range of pigments used that I was able to identify. Um, and I'll also provide a brief outline of the painting's condition and material history, and how this also affected my treatment decision. Um, and finally, I'm going to discuss the various stages of the treatment itself, with particular focus on my approach to the retouching of the work. Um, so when it comes to conserving works of art, it is important to consider the context within which it was produced. This includes factors such as um, the artist's working process and their possible aesthetic intent, um, as well as the function of the work itself and how its original audience would have perceived it. However, as you probably know, sometimes this information is not readily available as artworks have often been divorced from their original context. And this is definitely the case with the Parmentia panel which is currently displayed in a non-original frame and um, forms part of this diverse collection which features works from different periods and from different regional schools as well. Um, in, addition, uh, in addition to this, the Parmentia panel was painted in multiple stages, consisting essentially of various campaigns that appear to have been added at different dates. Um, the first campaign, um, which is not as visible as it probably was originally, um, consists of this green and white layer, which has been suggested as a form of polychrome decoration, which may have been intended to mimic marble or porphyry. Um, and it is visible in certain parts of the painting still. I've just highlighted it here, um, just above Christ's head. So you can still see it in the painting where the top black layer has been abraded. Um, and this polychrome layer was subsequently overpainted at an unknown date corresponding to the time when the black background was added, as well as the figures of Christ and the two prophets, and the white scroll was probably added at this stage as well. And 
final and the third painting campaign consists of the Doge figures and the saints that we saw previously. And since the inscription from 1519 refers to these figure groups, it's likely that they were added at the same date as well. Um, and finally, the final painting campaign represents that the heraldic device that we see on um, John Parmentier's pre dieu and the date of this edition is also unknown. Um, the painting's complicated material structure and lack of knowledge pertaining to its original context made it necessary for me to form an appreciation of its possible function based on physical evidence gained from the work itself. And looking at the unusual size and orientation of the panel suggests that it was not intended as an artwork in the conventional sense. But given the painting's horizontal orientation and large format, it is possible that it may once have been a predella belonging to a larger altarpiece. Um, and in the um, exhibition catalogue that's over there, um, it was indeed concluded that the panel was once a predella and that the donor figures and the saints were added together with the text to ex existing scrolls when the panel was adapted and personalised by the Parmentians in 1519. Um, and the cut grooves that you see on the back of the panel, um, in this picture it's probably not so clear, but there's a cut groove in the centre of the painting and there's one on the far left on the far right where they chiselled out part of the panel essentially making a slight recess. Um, and they're quite similar to what we see on the back of other altar pieces. Um, and these grooves are made to facilitate the assemblage of a larger altar piece structure. Um, and you can see it, um, this is just an example of a predella box from the Oplinter reticle in Bourbinge, where vertical wooden slats were inserted into the back of the panel in order to create a predella box. So just going back, it's, it's possible that um, evidence from the panel suggests that it had been nailed to something in these groups from the front. Um, and then these nails were subsequently covered over on the face of the panel. Um, which suggests that it might have been assembled already before it was painted. This was not uncommon. Sometimes you'd put um, the wooden structure together or you'd put a painting in an engaged frame and then you would, would paint over, over that when it was already assembled. Um, and indeed, not so visible in this image, up the top of the painting of the panel, the wood has been reduced slightly as well. So it looks like it might have been inserted into an engaged frame or another sort of structure. And on the front of the painting, there's actually a lip where the paint stops, um, and we call that the bar, where there's just a slight area of raised paint. And this also suggests that it may have been painted when it was already assembled. Um, so in addition to looking at the physical structure of the painting support, information regarding the former function of the panel can also be gained through um, comparing it with other works from this period. Um, and in terms of style and composition, the Parmentier panel shows many common qualities with this predella um, from an altar piece in Abbeford, um, which also features a monochrome background. In this predella, the central figures are also arranged in a similar fashion to the large figures in the Parmentier panel with their bodies just cut off below the shoulders. In addition, the Abbeyrode Predella features a donor figure and an inscribed scroll on the left-hand side, as well as a coat of arms on the right. Interestingly, it has also been thought that the Predella may have had an alternate function prior to its incorporation into the altarpiece, which has also been suggested for the Parmentier panel. A similar composition, featuring Christ in the centre flanked by six apostles, on either side can be seen in this predella from a church in the Papendorf district of Bergheim in Germany. This predella also has similar large dimensions to the Parmentier panel, measuring 37.5 by 242.5 centimetres. And predellas such as these were often prefabricated workshop productions created for an expanded commercial market in Northern Europe at the beginning of the 16th century. These predellas were typically decorated with conventionalised scenes from the Passion, which could then be personalised by individual parishes um, or using donor figures or inscriptions. However, whilst the format of the Parmentier panel bears many similarities with other extant predellas from the 15th and 16th centuries, the compositional arrangement of featuring Christ in the centre is unusual compared with other predellas of this period. 
The predellas of later medieval and Renaissance periods commonly featured narrative scenes which were complementary to the lives of the persons depicted in the main register of the old piece. Furthermore, these narratives were often more subdued in style compared to the elaborate detail reserved for the central composition. And um, taking this into account, um, the celestial connotations inferred by the placement of Christ in the centre of the panel may seem out of place, especially considering the subservient function of a predella within the context of a large altarpiece. Um, it was therefore suggested to me by um, Susie Nash, who's a um, lecturer in um, medieval painting at the Courtauld, as well as her PhD student, Emmanuel Capron, um, that the Parmentier panel, apart from being a bedella, uh, features a composition that's more consistent with um, so-called superseal registers. Um, and the superseal bears the same horizontal format as a bedella, but is placed above the altarpiece as opposed to below. Um, and comparable examples include this um, super seal here, which is um, part of the triptych of the burning bush by Nicholas Fromont, um, which features a super seal bearing a representation of God the Father with surrounding angels. And again, another example can be seen in this 18th century drawing after the lost adoration of the true cross altarpiece. And here, the compositional arrangement features God the Father in the centre with flanking prophets on either side. However, the decorative element of the porphyry imitation, which I discussed earlier, um, posits yet another interpretation for the panel, um, which may be more closely related to um, the tradition of instrument or furniture ornamentation. Um, however, whilst um, comparable examples featuring faux marble decoration have yet to be found on altarpieces, pieces, um, similarities between the Parmentier panel um, can be seen uh, in these two lid panels from Cologne that are thought to belong to a set of relatively chests. Um, and a purely decorative arrangement can be seen on the outer face of each lid panel consisting of a red monochrome background and gilt star ornamentation. Um, the two external panels also bear a similar horizontal format to the Parmentier panel. Um, and although the lid panels do consist of two boards each as opposed to just one, um, the dimensions are comparable with the large size of the Parmentier panel as well. Um, and moreover, the outer face of each lid panel, um, there are two recessed grooves similar to the ones I pointed out in the Parmentia panel. And these were cut in order to facilitate the insertion of strap hinges. Um, and although these similarities offer only mere conjecture um, when it comes to the previous function of the Parmentia panel, they serve as, I feel, an interesting juxtaposition that challenges our current understanding of the painting which may indeed have served an initial utilitarian purpose. Um, and in addition to these um, hypotheses that I mentioned, um, further suggestion for the function of the panel include a decorative piece for a door lid or, or a similar architectural unit, although comparable examples are yet to be found as well. Um, and although it wasn't possible for me to provide a definite attribution relating to the form and function of the panel, if complex material composition and various painting campaigns does suggest that its purpose may have changed during the course of its history as well. Um, so although the question of the panel's form and function essentially remains unanswered, um, it's still possible to draw conclusions regarding its origin um, based on stylistic and material similarities with contemporary works from this period. Um, now, the, the inscription from 1519 does suggest that a French artist or workshop is responsible for at least one of the painting's campaigns. However, the style used to represent the figure of Christ and the two prophets is more reminiscent of works by Netherlandish and Flemish artists of the 15th and 16th centuries. Christ's face um, shows the same elongated features that you see in portraits by Robert Campen and Roger van der Baden. And the most striking example was probably this, which um, was highlighted in the 2013 technical examination of the Brock family triptych, um, which in turn draws upon Van der Weyden's earlier Last Judgment onto peace. However, although the likenesses between Van der Weyden's representation of Christ and the one seen in the Parmentia panel are indeed striking, it is not possible to say that um, the artists of the former directly inspired the latter. Um, of course, it is possible that the artists of the Parmentier panel had access to 
um, drawings or other secondary representations of Van der Beelen's painting. However, I feel it's more likely that they were drawing upon contemporary representations of Price by other, work, other, other artists' workshops as well. And this is outlined by Gideon Therin in her Century of French Painting, 1400 to 1500, um, where she states that painting, French painting during this period was considerably influenced by the workshops of Flanders, in particular artists and workshops situated in the northern French provinces. Many artists even travelled across the border to serve the Burgundian court, injecting the French school of painting with the developments taking place across the border. And the influence of Flemish art upon French painting can be seen in the work of northern French artists such as Simon and Marmion. For example, in this St. Burton altarpiece, the physiognomy of Marmion's figures bear many similarities to those seen in paintings by contemporary Flemish masters. Um, and the turban prophet on the, on the left hand side of the painting, as well as the red foot prophet on the right, do not bear the same elongated facial features as Christ, but they nonetheless seem to belong to the same painting campaign based on similarities between their, hand, their handling. Um, and although it wasn't possible to establish the identity of the two prophets in the absence of an inscription, similar representations can be seen in other paintings dating to this period. A French example um, dating to the end of the 15th century is a panel featuring three prophets attributed to Jean Chagenet of Burgundy and this panel depicts the prophets of the Annunciation, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and is dated to around 1490. Um, and sim a similar representation I found was on the outer wings of a passion altarpiece, with scenes from the life of St. Thomas of Canterbury, now in Bas Alf Mans in Germany. Um, and in this example, the iconography represented belongs to the Arm of Christi, featuring Pontius Pilate, St. Peter, and the serving maid. Caiaphas and Judas with a purse containing pieces of silver. Um, but in contrast to the style of the larger figures, the smaller donor figures, uh, which most likely belong to another campaign, um, show a more linear approach to form. Uh, I felt that the style of the, these figure groups makes use of flat planes of colour and sharp contours, which is more reminiscent of French manuscript illumination of this period which further strengthens that it was a different hand that came to these paintings. And this can be seen in the works of artists such as the French Limbourg brothers, as well as the master of the Harvard Handel in this example here. So now moving on to the technical analysis that I did. Um, the materials that I identified on the painting are essentially consistent with um, northern panel paintings of this period. Um, for one thing, the panel support consists of a single um, board of wood, um, and although further analysis such as um, wood sampling is necessary to uh, definitively confirm the type of wood used, I find that the regularity of the grain as well as the density of the grain as well suggests that it is likely to be oak. And oak was the most common type of support used by northern artists in the 15th and 16th centuries, and it was used almost exclusively in the Netherlands during this period. Another, thing, another interesting feature which I found on the reverse of the panel is an incised mark which is sometimes referred to as a gouged sign or a goose madkin. Um, in this case it consists of an N-shaped mark with two lines running through it. And we see in the drawing if we highlight this a little bit better. Um, and these marks are found almost exclusively on oak panels deriving from the Baltic region. Um, another example of a Gutsmanken is the mark for a historic trading company that was based in uh, present-day Gdansk, which consists of a cross inside a triangle. And furthermore, wood that bears these marks, whether found on altars or panel paintings, seem to have been produced during the 15th century and to the last quarter of the 16th century. And this date range corresponds to the suggested date of the panel for the inscription as well. In addition, most of these marks have been found on Brabant panels from Antwerp, Bruges, um, Brussels, and Louvain. However, there are also a number of North German altarpieces that bear marks belonging to the Baltic trading companies. <laughs> Cut marks like these are to be expected on panels used in Northern Europe if the wood derived from the Baltic region, where it was marked before shipment to the Hansa towns for further manufacturing. And um, through my reading, I found that there have been several hypotheses for the function of these gouged marks within the context of the Hanseatic timber trade. 
One interpretation is that these marks served as a form of quality mark for wood in stock. Although it has also been speculated that the lumberjacks in the Baltic region may have made these marks, or possibly that they served as a means of identifying the forest owner and timber producer. It is also possible that the marks acted as a way for the Hanseatic merchants to mark their goods and track their journey as they travelled across both naval and overland routes. Um, although since many of these marks have been destroyed in the subsequent preparation process of the wood for um, painting or sculpture, they are essentially of little value in the information they supply and they are also often difficult to identify. Um, I feel that it's likely that the remnant groups make and provided a number of different functions as opposed to just one. However, until a systematic study conducted involving these marks um, exists, their interpretation will remain limited. Although it does highlight that the wood is likely to be oak and derived from the Baltic, which again strengthens the northern attribution of the painting. The pigments I identified on the painting are also characteristic of 15th and 16th century northern workshop productions. And the ground layer, which is the first layer that you add to the painting to prepare the support, um, was shown to consist of chalk or calcium carbonate, as well as a dark pigment that is most likely a form of carbon black. Um, and chalk grounds are also characteristic of northern paintings of this period. And this contrasts with southern European um, panel preparation that you see in a lot of Italian medieval paintings, um, where gypsum or um, calcium sulfate is more commonly employed. Um, other pigments that I identified in the paint layers included vermilion um, or mercuric sulfide, um, a copper green pigment, which may be um, verdigris as it was known traditionally, azurite, which is also a copper based blue pigment, um, a lead based yellow pigment, as well as an organic red lake. And just to demonstrate, this is a cross section of paint that I took from the Robe of Christ. And in this cross section, you can see the combination quite clearly where the artist used azurite, which is the bluish pigment particles, um, combined with lead white, as well as an organic red lake. Um, the top layer you see here is actually not original overpaint and is not representative um, of the pigments that the artist used. Um, and um, just to highlight, the use of azurite is also very consistent with northern um, European panel paintings of this period, um, as it was in the most commonly used blue as opposed to ultramarine, which was more often used in Italy. Um, and in, in addition, the layer structure of the paint in certain areas, as well as some of the pigment mixtures used, um, bear similarities with other northern paintings from the 15th and 16th centuries. And for example, the combination of azurite and red lake was commonplace for um, purple paint mixtures in northern European paintings during this period, and has been identified in paintings by Austrian, German, Netherlandish, as well as Flemish artists. In this virgin and child enthroned with, oh, I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> in the virgin and child enthroned with angels and saints by Michael Parker. Um, the blue-purple velvet of the Bishop Saint's cape was painted using a mixture of azurite, red lake, and lead white. Um, you can see on the right here. Um, similarly, the use of purples based on azurite and red lake mixtures have been found in a high proportion of early Netherlandish and German paintings, exemplified by the workshops of Robert Campen, Roger van der Baden, Dirk Bouts, Stephen Lochner, and Gerard David. And like I said, although ultramarine was very occasionally used in purple paint mixtures, as seen in, seen in Lady Don's purple robe in Hans Memling's Don triptych, azurite is rather more frequently found in northern workshop productions. And another notable use of paint can be seen in this cross section, which was taken from the red section of the right hand prophet's robe, uh, which shows three discernible layers of red paint. Um, the first layer is quite coarsely ground, and it consists of vermilion and carbon black. Um, and a more finely ground layer was added on top of this under layer, consisting purely of vermilion, as well as smaller additions of lead white. Um, I just want to point out that the uppermost layer in this cross-section um, is a recent restoration layer, which contains vermilion and a zinc-based pigment, which indicates that it was added later, at least in the 18th century. 
And during the 15th and 16th centuries, it was very common for northern artists to build up passages of red paint using a variety of layer structures. Um, for example, in the workshops of Jan van Eyck, Dirk Bouts, and Hans Memling, some passages of red have an underpaint of opaque red vermilion, followed by a layer of red lake pigment mixed with lead white. Another variant of such layer structures can be seen in the works of Gerard David, where lead white was added to vermilion and red lake in the underlayers. And in the workshop of Roger van der Baden, it was common to make use of an underlayer in the red draperies. Um, and this can be seen in the exhumation of St. Hubert, where St. Hubert's light pinkish red chasuble has an orange red underpaint consisting of vermilion mixed with red lake. In the early part of the 16th century, there was also a tendency in the work of some painters for the modelling to become a bit more simplified and more directly achieved by the addition of white or black to the underlayer. Um, and two paintings from the workshop of um, the Master of 1518, seeing here the visitation and the flight into Egypt, show the use of a brown underpaint layer for the red and pink draperies. Um, this underpaint layer consists of varying proportions of vermilion, lead white and black, often followed by more brightly coloured layers um, containing red lake and lead white varying proportions. And similarly, in Marinus van Reymersvala's two tax scales, the underlayer of the red drapery contains vermilion and a black pigment. Um, and the use of an underlayer facilitated uh, a more economical painting technique, whilst also contributing to the modelling of the draperies, which could then be emphasised using red lake glazes. And although no red lake glaze was identified in either of the red paint layers in the Parmentier panel, I found that the clear use of a layer structure in order to achieve the red tonality of the prophet's robe echoes this practice of um, northern painting workshops at the turn of the century. Moreover, the use of a darker underpaint layer, consisting of vermilion and black, appears more consistent with the simplified methods identified in Flemish and Netherlandish paintings dating to the early 16th century, as opposed to 15th century productions. Um, and again, this similarity strengthens the suggested um, date range for the painting, um, which the inscription states is the early 16th century. Now, the research I conducted regarding the origins and possible function of the Parmentier panel proved useful when it came to treating the painting. The initial examination of the panel showed that there were extensive losses to the original paint and ground layers throughout the painting. And these losses have subsequently been overpainted as part of several past restoration campaigns, including a treatment that took place at the Courtauld in 1962. As part of my assessment of the panel's condition, I tested the solubility of these various retouching campaigns, as well as the solubility of the varnish, using a range of organic solvents. And these tests showed that the varnish had actually not discovered, uh, discolored significantly and therefore did not disrupt the colour balance within the painting. Um, however, the tests and the old retouching um, provided me with quite a clear picture of the extensive damage to the original paint layers, and particularly in the black background, which had been overpainted almost completely using a resinous retouching medium. And due to the extent of the restoration present on the painting, and the seemingly poor condition of the underlying original paint, um, I decided that the retouching and the varnish should be obtained. And in making this decision, I was essentially choosing to value the aesthetic coherence of the work over the fragmented nature of the original paint. Um, historically, the composition would have played an important devotional role for its audience, and in this sense, my treatment decision was significantly influenced by my interpretation of the panel's previous function. And having made the decision not to clean the painting, I was faced with the challenge of approving the appearance of its surface. Um, although the varnish had not discolored significantly, it still had a very patchy appearance with varying levels of gloss and saturation. Um, and in order to improve this, I added a resaturating layer um, using MS2A, which is a synthetically synthesized ketone resin, um, which has better aging properties compared to traditional natural resin varnishes. After varnishing the painting, it was also necessary to address several new losses in the black background and fig groups. Um, you can see here, these are just a couple of um, before and after images. So you can see the white fills um, in the above image, 
which has been retouched um, in the lower image. Um, the aim of the retouching was to improve the aesthetic of the painting by making the composition more legible, whilst also respecting the various painting campaigns as well as the material history of the object. Here are just some more examples. The approach to the retouching was also guided by the previous restoration campaigns. The figure groups were filled and retouched mimetically, as these areas had already been brought to a higher level of finish compared to the rest of the painting. So these are the white fills that you see in the areas that contain the figures. Um, in the black background, however, the retouching was applied directly on top of the wooden support, as the emission of fills were more in keeping with the existing restoration in this area. And just you can sort of see it in the upper um, upper left hand image where the prophet has two large losses showing the wooden support right next to his head. Um, and then in the below image, um, you can see I've retouched them out, but using um, just the resin itself and not the fills. Um, and in addition to this, efforts were also made to integrate areas of old retouching that had discovered and no longer matched the original surrounding paint. Um, during the retouching process, it was this, uh, at this point when I decided that it would be appropriate to leave the copper green marbling visible around Christ's head exposed as this represents an earlier painting campaign that is of interest, I feel, to us historians and conservatives alike. Um, the various campaigns are of interest historically as they show the history of the object as an artwork that was constantly being reinvented to suit the needs of its patrons and audience. Um, well, I'd like to thank you all for listening and I hope this talk has demonstrated how both technical analysis and art historical research play an important role when it comes to conserving works of art. In the case of the Parmentia panel, my research provided me with a greater understanding of the painting's origins and possible form of function, which in turn influenced my final treatment decision. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Society of Antiquities for entrusting the treatment and the technical examination of the painting to me. Uh, the project provided me with an amazing opportunity where I was able to explore um, the history and material technique of this historical object whilst also developing my skills as a paintings conservator. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions regarding the treatment or the research or indeed any aspect of the course at all. <laughs> Thank you.